Hey, are you sick and tired of watching the gay son on Dynasty pop in and out of the closet like a jack-in-the-box? Is he gay or straight this week or what? Also, did you stop watching Hollywood Squares when Paul Lynn died and even Richard Simmons can't cheer you up? Were you under the impression that Madam's Place is the only gay show on TV? Are you tired of being the invisible woman? Do you watch Cagney and Lacey every week hoping that they'll kiss? Well, you must be tired of seeing yourselves through the eyes of the straight media. Hi, I'm Silvana Moscato, and you're watching the premiere of Our Time. For the next 13 weeks, we'll explore the diversity of the lesbian and gay experience from our own perspectives. You'll meet politicians, actors, filmmakers, activists, and people on the street. We might even catch you with our cameras as we go out and ask our questions of this week. I'm Vito Russo, and tonight on Our Time, author John D'Amelio is going to tell us about his new book on the history of the gay movement before Stonewall. And that's a period of time that we're going to be taking a closer look at tonight when we talk to two people who began this movement or helped to begin it in the early 40s and 50s. Also, Marsha Pally is going to take us on a visit to New York's newest gay theater company, and you're going to see an exciting scene from Robert Chesley's hit play, Stray Dog Story. All this and a lot more. But now, let's take a look at the first in a series of answers to our question of the week. Is there a lesbian and gay community? Is there? Well, I think that a lesbian and gay community exists in the hearts and minds of all of us, but that it does not always exist except in times of a crisis, such as the closing of a, of a, a women's bar or the beating up by the police of the uh, gay brothers in blues, um, the you know, defeating of gay rights legislation. In times of war, we seem to have a community. I would like there also to be a community very visible and, and out there for me in times of peace. My guest tonight is author John D'Amelio. He wrote the brand new book, Sexual Politics, Sexual Communities, A History of the Gay Movement during the, from the 1940s through the 1970s. Good evening, John. Hi, Silvana. How are you tonight? Good. Good. I'd like to start out by asking you, uh, how did you come to write the book? And in your answer, if you could tell us what made you choose that title. Well, I was a graduate student in the early years of gay liberation in the 1970s and was part of the group of men and women who started the Gay Academic Union in 1973. And I can remember at one of the meetings, Jonathan Cass and Martin Duberman talking about gay history. And to me, it was a brand new idea, and I didn't know exactly what it was, but I knew that I wanted to do it. I decided to start researching the thing that I was most interested in, which was gay politics, and began this history of the gay movement before Stonewall. Where the title came was that I realized in the course of my research that you can't just talk about gay politics without also talking about community. And that in fact, even though we tend to separate the two, that gay politics and gay communities are two sides of the same coin. Uh, the reason the gay movement grew is because there was a gay community that was growing and the other way around also works. As we said earlier, your book covers the period from the 1940s through the 1970s. Can you tell us briefly what were the significant events of each of the decades that helped shape our movement? Well, in many ways, the events that shaped our movement are the same things that shaped American society during these years. In the 1940s, for instance, World War II was critical in creating gay and lesbian communities yeah. in American cities. One of the ways I describe it in my book is to call World War II a nationwide coming out experience. Lots of men and women, young men and women, were taken from their families uh, and had the freedom to explore being gay for the first time. They left home, they stayed in big cities during the war and after the war, and began creating a whole subculture of bars and other kinds of institutions that gave them a real sense of not being isolated, but instead being members of a community for a change. And then what happened in the 50s? Well, in the 50s, in a sense, just as this 
period of li liberalization is moving and communities are growing, gay people were confronted with the reality of the McCarthy era. Mm -hmm. And McCarthyism wasn't just a movement that attacked communists and radicals, but it really went after gay men and lesbians with a vengeance. So that throughout the 50s, what you see happening is gay men and women in American cities really being hounded, being hounded by the federal government, being hounded by the military, and being hounded by urban police forces. And how did this hounding get people together? Well, one of the things that it did paradoxically is, despite all the trouble, to really give men and women a sense of belonging to a group. When the police raided a gay bar or a lesbian bar, you knew that you were in this together. It also meant that it was very hard for people to work as activists in a movement because they were terrified. Uh, but it provided the conditions that helped create a gay community in times of adversity. And in the 60s, what did they bring us? Well, the 60s, the 60s is one of the most tumultuous decades in American history. And I think the aspect of the 1960s that most affected gay men and lesbians was the black civil rights movement. Uh, the image of black people saying, we're not afraid, we're standing up for our rights, and coining slogans like black is beautiful resonated with the gay experience. So you have gay activists starting to say, gay is good. And really, by the time of the Stonewall Riot at the end of the 1960s, what you already have is a fairly well-developed gay civil rights movement in this country and very large gay communities that are already well-established and part of the urban fabric. We were everywhere by then, I guess. More than everywhere. And tell me, what uh, in, your, in the course of your work in writing the book, what did you notice most about a community g growing up among people who have a similar sexual preference as opposed to a community growing up of people who have an ethnic background in common? Well, there are similarities and there are differences. One of the obvious similarities is that the gay and lesbian community of today has many of the same institutions that ethnic and racial communities have. We've created newspapers, cultural institutions, churches. One of the big differences, and something that's really shaped our psyche and our community, is the fact that we don't grow up in a gay and lesbian community. We grow up in straight society and have to find our way into a community of our own people. Mm -hmm. And it's, this is something that we always have to come to grips with. Yeah, yeah. And in, uh, in researching the book, you were writing the history of a people who are not easily identifiable. Did that present any particular problems? It presented a lot of problems. I had to develop not just the skills of a historian of searching for documents, but I had to develop the skills of a private detective, too. People used pseudonyms in the 50s. Many of them had disappeared for 20 years. And somehow or another, I had to read those newsletters with phony names and find a way of discovering these people 20 or 30 years later. So if I don't get a job as a historian, I can retool <laughs> some other way. Well, thank you for coming and spending this time with us tonight on Our Time. And coming up next on Our Time, Vito Russo talks with pioneer activists Barbara Giddings and Harry Hay. I'm sitting here with two very special people who helped to found the gay liberation movement. And together, they've put in over a half a century of work in the movement which, as we just found out from John D'Amelio, is a lot older than most people think. Barbara Giddings is the coordinator of the Gay Task Force for the American Library Association, and she's been active in the gay movement for 25 years. 33 years ago, Harry Hay and a few other people got together and began to form the nucleus of an organization which would eventually become the Mattachine Society, probably the oldest gay activist organization in America in the post-war years. And I want to start out first by talking a little bit about the sense I have that most lesbians and gay men in America today have no idea, they haven't got the vaguest idea what it took to get them to a place in their lives where they now take for granted some of the things that only a decade ago or a little longer than that were unheard of. And I, I want to start with you, Harry, to ask you just, first of all, what was it like for you personally to be gay in the 1940s? And what do you think the catalyst was in your life that made you an organizer, uh, that made you, put you, had to give you the courage to, to get out there at a time when even the word homosexuality wasn't spoken out loud? Well, um, I had been being an organizer almost against my will. I was really an educational director. Um, in the early 30s, I had begun organizing migratory farm workers, for example, in 1933 and 1934. And my whole feeling was that I wanted to be involved 
with, with helping people better their lives and, and find ways and means by which they could become people in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I had, been working, uh, I had been working myself as a migratory worker in the hay hayfields in the summertime since 1925, 1926. So that in 1932 and 33, when there wasn't any money, when there wasn't any funds, and people had to come together in order to, to cooperate, in order to survive, I find myself thinking this is what I wanted to do. And always I believed, because I've been believing this, I guess, since I was about 13 or 14, that I would help other people. And someday, when it came time for me to find out who I was and to tell other people how beautiful it was to be what we called then a temperamental man, not we didn't have the word gay then, I felt that they would help me. And it wouldn't be until the late 40s, it wouldn't be until just about the time of the war years and just after, that I suddenly began to realize they were not going to help me and I was going to have to do it on my own. But I also could say to the hetero world, well, thank you very much. I have learned a lot of how to organize and how to, how to reach people. You have taught me what it means to live as an outlaw in your society legally, when I had been an outlaw sexually all my life anyway. So to move from the legal position of outlaw to a position of outlaw sexuality on an open basis mm -hmm. was just that not that much of a step. I just simply thought, well, now it's time for me to organize my people. We're being thrown out of the State Department. We're being, we're, we are probably going to be the new scapegoats in the, in the new police world that seems to be coming up as a result of the Smith Act and the Munt Nixon Bill and things like that had passed in 1948 and 49. And I felt, now we are going to be the new scapegoats and we've got to organize. We've got to find out who we are before we get clobbered. Did you meet a lot of resistance from other gay people? I mean, here you were totally. with an idea, you know, and you went to other gay men or, and, and even lesbians and said, we've got to organize. What did they say? Well, um, uh, you can read in Jonathan Katz how, what happened in, in the thing. I got an idea in 1948. And for two years, I ran around looking for my first recruit. So it took, I ran into organized resistance all over the place. And finally, in the first part of July of 1950, I found a gay man who said, this is exactly what, the way I feel about it, too. Let's work on it together. Mm -hmm. So I, I, as everybody knows, the first action that the gay movement, shall we say, took, two of us, was that this is the beginning of the Korean War. We went down onto the gay beach in Los Angeles and got 500 signatures on the Stockholm Peace Petition. That was our first action. Did you have a, a vision then of what it was going to be? I mean, uh, did, did you think, well, I'm going to try this and maybe nothing will come of it? Or did you think someday this is going to grow into a really vital national movement and people are going to know that it was right? Well, as, uh, as you probably know, I'm, I'm, I am at present involved in what is known as the Radical Ferry Movement. Right. And I had been dreaming about, I dreamt even then, of the idea that there would be networks of sanctuaries, of places where we could come and out of which we would be able to move and organize and change things across the country. I didn't think that we would be able to flower as we have. I didn't yeah. expect that that fast. But I did a dream of maybe 50 or 60 networks of core groups around the country who would come out and make an appearance, pass out leaflets, zap, as you guys did in, in GAA in the 70s, and then disappear again. Right. Because I felt we were going to have to do that. Did you, was there a lot of fear around the very subject? Uh, was it a time in the late 40s and 50s when people uh, were worried that they might be on a list? Oh yes, oh yes. There was a, indeed, there was a great, a great feel there because you see, many of us began to recognize rather early that men who had gotten their training on the Red Squads, as they had been in the 30s and 40s, or let's say in the 20s, beginning with the Palmer Raids, had moved on from the Red Squad to the Vice Squad so that they had the same training and they were doing the same kind of thing. And people were aware of the fact, for instance, right in the start of the Civil War, they used to have these civil defense committees, block committees, and that any group of people who had more than four or five different people coming to their house, there would be some, some busybody on the block that was writing down all the license plate numbers. Right. And so that, yes, there was a fear. But by the same token, we decided very early that all we needed to do, we had learned a lot by this time from the progressive movements, that all we needed to do was to create a facade. Yeah. And then behind the facade, we could organize, which is what the Mattachine Foundation became. It became that facade, and it seemed to be built of solid marble, pink marble, of course, but <laughs> nevertheless, solid marble, and then behind that, we would organize. And what was wonderful about it is the moment that people felt that that facade was in place and they were safe, they, they overcame their fear and they turned out in droves. Why? 
because the idea of being together with 30 or 40 people talking about civil rights, talking about social problems, was so new, it was so heady, it was so wonderful. We were all using our, our body language and our gestures, and we were safe, and we were talking about things, and we were just sharing ideas like crazy. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful, heady time. Barbara, you've, you've talked about create, what, what Harry is just talking about is creating a safe environment for, for one's people. And I, I've heard you speak on various occasions about how you came to consciousness as a lesbian and then later how you came to a consciousness of the fact that there was a movement that you belonged in. And I'd like, to, like you, you to talk about your experience uh, in coming to the movement, in coming to realization that there were others. Well, I pick up on that phrase that Harry used, my people, is something that has been uh, a real guiding notion in my own life in the movement. Now, I was, I'm by temperament a joiner. I like to get into organizations and do things. And if the gay movement had not come along, I would probably be active in the conservation movement today. And let's face it, the gay movement's a lot more fun. But I heard about the gay movement by reading what was a very, uh, uh, seminal book of the time, The Homosexual in America, A Subjective Approach by Donald Webster Corey. And I was fascinated by the idea that a book on the subject could be published, a book by a homosexual. I contacted the author who lived in New York City and he told me about the newly formed Mattachine Society. So I, I took, I had two, the usual two weeks vacation and for the first time in my life, I bought a plane ticket and went up in the air and went to the West Coast and landed in the offices of one of the gay organizations in Los Angeles with a rucksack on my back. And I said, well, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> and they said uh, that there was just, uh, there was a gay women's organization that had been formed just the year before up in San Francisco. So I bought another ticket, got in the air again, and went up to San Francisco and contacted the Daughters of Belitis and they were just starting their publication called The Ladder. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I went to one of the, I was invited to one of their meetings and for the first time in my life, I was in a room together that was not a bar with about 15 other lesbians. And it was a really, a, it was a stepping stone for me. It Did was a wonderful entree into the movement. But I must say that at first my vision of what we could do was very vague and very formless. Unlike Harry, who I think had a very clear sense of what should be done and what uh, could be done, my feelings, like that of a lot of other people who just come into the movement for, for the social contact, for the companionship, for the feeling of belonging, mm -hmm. I didn't have very, a very strong idea of what could be done. At the time, it just seemed enough that my people were getting together and talking about our mutual problems. And I don't think I really developed, let's see, I got into the movement in 1958. I've been in the movement for 25 years now, and I don't think I really got a strong, coherent philosophy until the beginning of the 1960s when, as John D'Amelio has pointed out, there was a, a distinct change in the temper and tempo of our own movement sparked in large measure by the advances of the black civil rights movement. Right. And suddenly we began to see that the problem of homosexuality which is what we were organized around, was not our problem, but society's problem. Uh, that gay is good, in parallel with black is beautiful, that we had to not uh, uh, politely ask for a few crumbs of privilege from the table, but go out and demand rights in the courts and in other forums where we could get them. And the whole atmosphere changed, and I began to develop a very coherent, strong, positive feeling. We have actually a film clip that's really interesting. Lily Vincennes did uh, a film called The Second Largest Minority. And it's a, almost like a home movie of one of the first gay rights, public gay rights demonstrations, and you're in it. Uh, I'd like, like to roll a little bit of the film, and you, maybe you can tell us what it was like to be there on that day in 1967, I think. 1967, 67. outside Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Uh, one of the earliest, I, I think, gay picket lines. Um, and was this an organization that sponsored the demonstration, or was this? It was sponsored by a uh, group of gay organizations on the East Coast, and it was done as what we call the annual reminder day on Independence Day, July 4th, to remind the public that there is still a significant minority of Americans who do not benefit from the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness Barbara, that are guaranteed there, are. Us. there I am handing out leaflets, and the drill was you smile and you smile and you hand out to everyone, whether they take it or not. So there I am handing out leaflets. Well, were you scared? Oh, yes. 
it was, uh, there were very few people who really felt comfortable about uh, being in one of these demonstrations because you just didn't know what the consequences could be, whether you might uh, lose your job because your employer saw you on, on a television news clip uh, or somebody saw you in the street. It was scary. It's interesting to look at a film like that now from there, the perspective of today. If you could believe that the very first gay pickets had maybe 10, 15, at the most 20 people who could afford to get up in public and do this. Mm -hmm. And what, yes, it w it, we were apprehensive. What do you think, Harry? But proud. I, are you more involved in overt activity like being on the streets and being out there, or are you more involved in a, in a, in a self-knowledge of the homosexual? Oh, no. Uh, if, for instance, in the 60s and 67, when you were passing out leaflets, not on Independence Day, we would have been late in May. Um, KPFA, for instance, or KPFK, which was the Pacifica radio station, the, the nonprofit radio station on, in the air, would have a thing called the Renaissance Pleasure Fair. And in 1967, there was a sexual freedom booth. And John and I were passing out uh, gay lifestyle literature uh, at the sexual freedom booth, dressed, if you please, as two wandering gentlemen from Nuremberg of the 14th century, and selling our kaleidoscopes at the same time. So that we were actually dealing with the families came to buy our kaleidoscopes, and they all got literature on, on the uh, gay is good freedom lifestyle and so we were we were discussing what it meant to be gay and how how, what, how wonderful it was to be a gay couple and, and so on in 1967 uh, mm -hmm. at the freedom fair we were probably the only two gays there at the moment or the open gays but then uh, all we had 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 practice the year before when we went to form NACO in San Francisco uh, of uh, spending time on Telegraph Avenue talking about the gay lifestyle um, to, uh, to students of about oh, three or four hundred of them at a the time and on those open uh, cafes that they have along Telegraph Avenue. Right. Having just been, we had participated in a Freedom Day speech uh, rally that, about the afternoon before and been on a picket line and so on as open gay men. We've, in a few minutes, I'd like to really ask you both to answer. First of all, were there things that you didn't know then that you know now that would have shocked you then? I mean, was there anything uh, in, if someone came to you in the 1940s and said to you, this is going to happen someday, uh, and you would have said, that'll never happen. I mean, has anything shocked you about what's happened? And do you, do you think we've gone in a good direction? Are you pleased about some things and angry about some things? I'd like you both to answer this. Well, I, I wouldn't say I was, I've been shocked by some of the developments in the movement. I, I'd rather say I'm pleasantly surprised by some of the things that have come along. For example, I would never have dreamed in 1958 when I joined the movement that we could get the Psychiatric Association to turn around and take us off the list of mental disorders. I wouldn't have dreamed it possible for us to have groups of, of parents and friends of gays, people who are not even gay but who have a stake in our happiness uh, coming forward and, and talking to the public and having, making a bridge of communication. And I wouldn't have dreamed it possible to have uh, the gay choruses and the gay marching bands, which I think are just wonderful. I think they're terrific. Things like that I would not have dreamed of. What about you, Harry? Well, I'm differently from you. I, I think I might say that uh, I'm only surprised that parents and friends of gays didn't show up before they did. <laughs> because um, in, the, in the first Manitine Society, my mother was president. The uh, mother of one of the other men was secretary, and his sister was treasurer. Uh, we had, there, are certain, there were certain parents who gave a certain loyalty to their children whom they loved. I don't think my mother ever understood what it meant, what homosexuality was all about, but she had a total loyalty to us and to the men I knew because she thought they were wonderful people. And, mm -hmm. and this was enough for her and she stood for that. So I would have expected that type of loyalty from far more parents than showed up. Mm -hmm. I think that I would, this is something I might find. On the other hand, I feel myself that uh, the three questions that I posed my, in the fall of 1952 to one of our first conferences, who are we as gay people, where have we been and where are we going, and what are we for? These questions have not been addressed, they have not been answered, and I feel myself that until we answer them, until we're communicable about these things, we're not going to be ever be able to tell the heteros who we are, and when they, since they don't know who we are, they don't know it, how to relate to us and how to accommodate to us. And I think we have a great contribution to make to them, and I think we're unable to make that contribution so long as they only see us in the stereotypes they themselves have put upon us. Do you have a, a minute message, maybe, a, a tricentennial minute message for young lesbians and gay men today, Harry? I mean, what, 
some advice, maybe? Yes, I would. I would suggest, among other things, that we must begin to quit imitating the heteros as much as we do. And I think as far as the younger people are concerned, they've got a big step up on all of us because they haven't taken on as much of the of the frog skins that they've had to, that most of us have to wrap ourselves in in order to get through life that I've always said that we should tear off the ugly green frog skin and find the beautiful fairy prince underneath. And I hope all the young ones find the beautiful fairy prince tomorrow. That's great. Good. It's been. Um, my message is simply hang in there, folks, because those of us who are out are oiling the closet door hinges just as fast as we can. That's really That's great. That's lovely. <laughs> Thank I love you. That. It's been too short with both of you. You're both fascinating, and I'm glad to have had this time with you. Coming up, Cabaret and Tom Steele, Marsha Pally takes us to a gay theater. And now, why don't you take a look at some more answers to our question, is there a lesbian and gay community? Boy, is there. This portion of our time is brought to you by Christopher Street Magazine. Is there a gay community? I think it's obvious. I definitely think that there is a lesbian and gay community out here. Of course there is. There's supposed to be a million people in New York who are gay. Yes, there is. Look around you. There are a lot of gays in New York, New Jersey, and all over uh, the tri-state area that I've uh, met and seen. Um, I, be I believe there is a lesbian and gay community. Uh, a lot of times it's not... I wouldn't say that it's necessarily all that organized, uh, depending on what part of the country you happen to be in, but uh, obviously here in New York it's much more uh, prevalent than what it is elsewhere. In this town, definitely. Absolutely. Clearly defined. It's right here. We're here, in it. If there was a community, it wasn't very well held together, and I think that it's, it seems to be aging and changing. There um, seems to be the identity or something is not not there. Definitely, there seems to be a community of gays and lesbians here. I've noticed uh, section, certain sections of, of which led me to believe that they function as a group in a particular area. Uh, as a sole community, I don't think there is one, except for the common decency for each other. I think they're actually two separate communities. Uh, I personally don't feel that I'm involved in the lesbian community that I'm truly involved in the homosexual, the male community. Um, there is a lesbian and gay community in New York City. It's very active. Well, I would think so. I came from Stockholm, Sweden just one month ago and I've spent quite a lot of time in Greenwich Village. I've been down to Key West and I guess those are the two most gay communities I have ever seen. Yes, there is. And I think they need to have a own community one in, in the city and and I'm for it.
right, welcome back. I hope you're enjoying our show tonight, and we've got a lot more in store from you. Coming up later, Marsha Pally brings us to see a bit of a new exciting gay play. And also later, we'll tell you about a real exciting new film project that you can participate in. Now, many of you have, may be familiar with Tom Steele as the editor of Christopher Street Magazine. But more and more of you will soon, if you don't already, come to know him as one of New York's hottest cabaret performers. His act features original music and comedy. And coming up now, we'll see his satirical rendition, his one-man version of a gay pride rally. These are impressions that I have gleaned from attending actual gay pride rallies over the last eight years. This one takes place in a sort of imaginary Manhattan in the Sheep Meadow. Our hostess for the occasion is Coretta Sappho. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Come all the way forward, come all the way to the front, come into the Sheep Meadow, Gaze from Algonquin, hold your sign up, your group cannot find you. <laughs> gay youth, I have a request from gay youth for the North American Man Boy Love Association. Please keep your hands to yourselves. <laughs> you stay away from those boys now. Our first guest while we're coming into the sheep meadow today is Ma Louise Sun Person. She's going to sing a song that she wrote especially for this occasion. Merle? Thank you. You and me march forward as one under the name of supremacist sun. And we, we don't have much fun. A two-year-old woman is lost. <laughs> Could her mother please find her to the right of the platform, a two-year-old woman? And I have a wallet here belonging to a Bernard Steinberg. Bernard Steinberg, he is 32 years old. He lives at 117 Lafayette Street. Sound like a loft to me. <laughs> His phone number is 929-7334. He has an American Express gold card here. And here's a picture of him. Look like he's with his mother and his father. He's handsome. He looks like a good catch to me. You, you boys might want to have Bernard Steinberg for your lover. <laughs> oh, no, no. I would say here he... He got an appointment here at a VD clinic. <laughs> and he have a club bath card and a glory hole card, whatever that is. But never mind, we, we're glad to have people here of the Jewish persuasion, especially gay and proud people of the Jewish per persuasion like Bernard Steinberg, 929-7334. Our next guest speaker is a special guest named Brutus. He's from the Gay Men s and &M Activists Association. He's going to give a demonstration for us today. Thank you. <laughs> Our next guest has come to us all the way from Boston. Her name is Kathy Coalition, and she's come to tell us about a problem they're having up there. Kathy? <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> it, it certainly is a beautiful day out there, isn't it? A beautiful day to be gay and proud and never seems to rain on Gay Pride Day, does it? <laughs> no, well, uh, but while we're all enjoying the sunshine and gay love, Susan Sachs is languishing in a prison in Walpole, Massachusetts, a victim of the male patriarchy. This woman is being harassed by the INS, the CIA, the FBI, and the IRS. She has paid her taxes every single year, even while she's been in prison. Now I want all of the women I see out there today to take all of the literature and paraphernalia they may have collected during the course of today's march and just drop them. Drop them on the ground. Let the men clean up. 
God knows we've cleaned up after them year after year, cleaned up after them man-boy love and that disgusting s and demonstration. Now, wait a minute, Kathy Coalition. Wait a minute. We, we have to clean up after ourselves. We have a, a deal with the Parks Commissioner. We will clean up our areas. Clean up your areas unless you want to have the next gay pride rally out on a pier. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> You know, gay theater has a real long history in America. Some people think gay theater is Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest. Some poor misguided souls think gay theater is Debbie Reynolds in Woman of the Year. But it's an exciting time for real gay theater right now. We have a hit on Broadway which stars a gay man and it's called Torch Song Trilogy. There are gay plays running all over town and it's never been so alive as it is now. There's a new gay theater company in town called the Meridian Theater, and it was founded by Terry Helbing, who wrote a book on the history of gay theater and gay plays, and Terry Miller, who wrote his own play last year, Pine 79, it was produced off-Broadway. And they're now running Meridian Theater, and we visited them. Marsha Pally went over to the Shandall Theater, where they're producing Robert Chesley's Stray Dog Story, a very funny, very amusing little comic tragedy. And we're going to show you a scene from the play, but first, Marsha Pally is going to talk to the founders of Meridian Theater. Hi, this is Marsha Pally. I'm sitting in the Shandall Theater, where Stray Dog Story is playing. I have with me tonight Terry Miller and Terry Helbing, co-directors of the new Meridian Gay Theater Company. I think for clarity's sake, I better introduce you guys. To my left, with the dark hair, is Terry Miller. Farther down the line, with the blonde, shaggy coiffure, is <laughs> Terry Helbing. Uh, I'd like to start with the nitty-gritty, heavy stuff. What is gay theater? Oh, brother. Well, there's probably as many definitions to that, that term as there are people who would hold forth with one. Um, I guess for us, I can only answer for, for what we want gay theater to be at Meridian. So for us, um, a gay play has a major gay character or theme or has as its primary concern uh, gayness or a gay issue. Um, so that means that we don't include plays where there's a minor gay character that comes on at the end or we don't include what I call the grand hotel plays, which are, um, say, they're set in a public place or they're set in a, a, like a hotel or a diner and there's a, a black person and a lesbian and a prostitute and an alcoholic and a gay man. It's like you're, you're, you know, you're uh, uh, melting pot of society. We don't do plays like that. Um, the plays that are most concerned to us are plays that that uh, have a gay character, man or man or woman, as its main character and, or a gay theme. So therefore, there are several kinds of gay plays you could have. Um, because a gay, gay person wrote a play does not mean that that's therefore a gay play, because gay people can write about straight people as well. So conversely, uh, a straight person could write a gay play and, and be concerned about gay people. You mentioned the term uh, gay concern or theme. Give mm -hmm. me a few examples of gay concerns or themes. Well, there are many that, that um, I guess a lot of them that, that we've seen throughout the 70s are, say, the coming out plays. Um, you know, a, a gay person coming out to his family, usually at a holiday. But, uh, <laughs> um, or, or say a political play. Um, that's not something we're terribly interested in at Meridian anymore because they've been done so often. Um, we're not really interested in standing up on a soapbox and uh, preaching to, well, it's, those plays seem to pre preach to straight people, but what so ha happens so often with political theater is that, that they preach to the already converted. So that's sort of been done for us, so we don't really want to do that anymore. Um, I guess the coming out play, there's, there's well, what I said in my, in my book, The Directory of Gay Plays, is that, that I see as a very common concern of gay plays is what I call the relationship play. In other words, two people who um, either meet and are having a relationship or trying to set one up or trying to get one going or they're already in a relationship and they're having trouble and they're trying to work it out or something like that. Um, so that's, that's two basic examples. So how does a play get from the typewriter to the stage for you? How do you find them? Well, we have a... <coughs> We have a network that's been set up, uh, which we have sort of uh, in part inherited and in part created ourselves. Um, we can get play scripts coming in from uh, submissions directly to Meridian Theater, uh, which are basically unsolicited. We also have a playwriting contest, which is uh, done each year through our playwrights and directors group, uh, which we've sort of taken under our wing, uh, that had been part of the lines. 
Um, these playwriting competitions are yearly, they're international, and they bring in 150 to 250 scripts each time. Uh, those plays are then presented, uh, those that are selected are presented in a staged reading, usually here at the Shandell Theatre. So we get a chance to try the work out, see what it looks like. Uh, if it does well, it can move on to the next level of theatre, which is a full production. Or we can just come across the script ourselves through our own channels and present a production of it in that manner. You're doing two plays now, Stray Dog Story and Street Theatre. And I understand Street Theatre is being shown at the Mine Shaft. How did that come about? Well, basically, there was a production that I served as uh, associate producer on last uh, November. The, the play had first been done um, at Theatre Rhinoceros in San Francisco last February, and the New York production was done in the old Tassos space downtown on Church Street back in November. Uh, we got such reviews as Best Play of the Year by Bob Patrick and other stages and some, under uh, some other wonderful comments, but the play ultimately did not find its audience, I think for a variety of reasons. Uh, so. Meridian uh, was offered a uh, space at the mine shaft and uh, the production, uh, the play, and we all gave it a new production that's now directed by Ken Cook, and it's doing very, very well. It's very comfortable in the space, which does, for the time we're there, function as a regular legitimate theater with a separate entrance, and the audiences are quite comfortable. So is the play. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to talk about Stray Dog Story for a minute. You said that it was different from gay theater that had been done in the past. How, how is it different from gay theater? Oh, in a lot of ways. Um, first of all, in, in so many gay plays in the past, uh, you, had, you, you, you were in a situation where the play developed to the point of saying, uh, I'm gay, and there's a resolution to the plot development, and that's the end of the play. The question, uh, the issue, I'm gay, has been moved forward. So it is uh, now sometimes at the very beginning of the play, sometimes before the play starts, it basically has become a given. Uh, Stray Dog Story is even more unusual because it does not take uh, attack of there being any question about this. The issue is about an outsider and how our society treats an outsider, both our society, uh, our straight society and gay society, uh, how gay society responds to an outsider. This is something that I, I can't think of a single gay play that has explored in the past. What's the device for getting the outsider? The outsider in this case is a young man who at the beginning of the play is a dog and he is transformed from being a dog. A real dog. Oh, yes. <laughs> he's, he's transformed. No value judgment. There. Yes. <laughs> no, he's transformed from being uh, a dog into being a gay male by the dog's fairy dog mother. And all of that takes place within. Of course. <laughs> yes. All of that takes place within two minutes of the beginning of the show. Uh, he uh, then, for one reason or another, is, is, is let loose wandering around Manhattan, trying to discover uh, the nature of life in general as a, as a people and gay life more specifically, and how, he's, how people respond to him. Was he gay when he was a dog? More or less, <laughs> more or less. Good for him. Well, he, he, he was somewhat enlightened, let's put it that way. Yeah. Enlightened pup, okay, yes. okay. Thanks very much for joining us here tonight, and thank you for letting us use your theater. This is again Terry Miller and Terry Helbing of Meridian Gay Theater Company. We're now going to see a scene from Stray Dog Story. It was written by Robert Chesley and directed by Nicholas Deutsch. Buddy in the scene will be played by John Finch. Dondi will be played by Daryl Tolles. The policeman will be played by Stephen Landsman and Matthew Karras. Evening. Hi. Are you okay, child? Yeah, I guess I'm okay. Looks to me like you got hurt. Yeah, I guess I did. What happened? My foot's swelling up. It hurts. How'd you hurt it? Well, some people kicked me. Who did that to you? Some people who said they liked me. Ha! Ain't that the way it is? Is it? Always, honey, always. Well, John didn't kick me. John was exceptional. You know John? 
Let me tell you, honey, I've known lots of Johns, and if your John didn't kick you, he was the exception. Well, he didn't. He was good to me. I tell you, the last John I had, you know what he did to me? No. Wouldn't pay. Pulled a knife on me, tried to rob me. So I jumped from the car, told him his cock wasn't significant enough for me to pick my nose with. Gee. I should have cut it off and thrown it in his face. Say, my name's Dondi. Hi, I'm Buddy. What you doing, Buddy? Prowling around the streets like a lonesome lost dog. Yeah, I guess that's it. I can't find my way back to John. What's the candle for? This? Yeah. Somebody told me that it was for John. And that John wanted me to carry it. But it hasn't helped me any yet. And I don't understand. <laughs> There's so much I don't understand. Oh, well, don't let it distress you, child. I haven't been people very long. And I get so confused because I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And it seems like I'm always doing the wrong thing because I don't know any better. I wish I was a dog again, because none of this would have happened, and I'd still have John, and I miss him, and he loved me and fed me, and that's all I ever wanted. Oh, no, that's okay, child. Except I wanted to be a man, because John wanted that. He said he wanted a man to love. Here, child, let's light your candle, okay? Maybe it'll help. Yeah? Sure, it's worth a try. Thanks. Sure. Think nothing of it. You're nice. And you're awfully pretty. Why, thank you, child. I do what I can. Say, uh, are you hungry? You look like you could use a meal or two. Oh, I'm awfully hungry. What? Why don't you come along with me, child? I'll treat you to a feast at the new silver dollar. I got my earnings. Oh, gee, thanks. Really, that's awfully kind of you. Oh, think nothing of it. It's this way. What do they got to eat there? Meat? Oh. 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 Shit! Oh. Okay, Herbert. Oh. It's off to run. I haven't done a thing! Solicitation and possession. Oh, get your greasy hands off me, pig. You can't prove a thing. We don't have to, pervert. And you call me pervert? You want to know what pervert is? You're the perverts around here. No, I ain't going to get no justice out of the likes of perverts like you. It's pervert justice I'm going to get. Because white boys like you perverted all the justice there ever was in this country. Shut you up, people think you oh. Hey, that's my friend. Shut up, buddy. We'll haul you in, too. I don't get it. What's justice? It's a great play. Go and see it. Listen, you've been hearing a lot tonight about the political, the social, and the cultural events that led up to the modern-day gay liberation movement of the 1970s and 80s, back in the 40s and the 50s, when people had to be braver. And finally, all of those events are being captured in a really wonderful new film project called Before Stonewall. And at this time in history, it's particularly exciting because PBS and various other funding organizations have begun to fund a gay project for the first time. Greta Schiller, Andrea Weiss, and John Scagliotti are the filmmakers who are putting together something called Before Stonewall. And they're going to need your help, right, Silvana? Yes, Vito. The producers would like you to contribute artwork, magazine clippings, newspaper clippings, your old photographs. Remember, even you and your lover on the beach at the Pines can be part of our history. So take this opportunity to participate in this exciting project. One of the things 
that you can do is to contact the filmmakers through us. Later on, before the end of the show, you'll find the address of the Before Stonewall project on your screens. So get a pencil and make sure you write it down if you have anything that you can contribute to that project. I'd like to show you some raw footage that the filmmakers have collected. It's not going to be in the film in this form, but I think it's exciting to look at what they found, for instance, just recently in Los Angeles. Lisa Ben is a woman who in the 1940s was working at MGM publicity department and started what was then the first gay newspaper. Uh, it was called Vice Versa and Lisa Ben itself is an acronym for the word lesbian. Most people didn't use their own names in those days. And the filmmakers recently stopped in Los Angeles and talked to Lisa and we have a little film of Lisa singing some songs, uh, songs that she used to sing back in the 40s to gay people at parties and in bars. So let's listen for a little while now to one of those songs. After supper I'll retire to my chair before the fire. Gay dinner was delicious. Now you can do the dishes. I've been asked to hold in cowboy clothes on Listen, the filmmakers want to hear from you, but so do we. If you're a lesbian or a gay man out there and you want to tell us whatever you think belongs on a gay television show, please write to us at Our Time, WNYC TV, number one Center Street, New York, 1007. We're going to be reading some of your comments on the air from time to time, so if you have anything to say to us at all, please get in there and write to us. And hey, listen, if you're also a right-wing religious fanatic who hates our guts and thinks that we're all going to burn in hell, so be a jackass. Send us a letter. We'll read it on the air. What the hell? Right, Silvana? Right, Vito. And coming up next week on Our Time, we'll take a look at a serious issue hitting our community. We'll take a look at the problem of alcoholism and drug abuse in the lesbian and gay community. And we'll meet two people who have beat it. I'm Silvana Moscato. Also next week, Marsha Pally interviews hot director John Sayles about his new hit film, Liana. And in closing, I'd like to mention that lesbian playwright Jane Chambers died of cancer at the age of 45 just last week, and we'd like to dedicate this premiere program of our time to her. Good night, and remember, better blatant than latent. Do you know about the Stonewall riots? I don't know all the details, but I know a few years ago there was a riot that, was, uh, con that happened over some gay issue. I don't really know the facts of that. No, I don't. I have no idea. I'm ashamed I probably should know, but I don't. No, I never did. I never heard of them. I never heard about it. No, I don't think so, but if you'd tell me a little about it, perhaps I would. <laughs> you know, I know that the uh, bar was, uh, um, the Stonewall bar was uh, raided and a lot of gay people were hurt and injured and from then started the uh, gay rights movement. Mm -hmm.